Good morning, everybody. Um, as you said, I'm Eric Matson. Uh, I'm a professor. I've been here at Purdue now about 10 years. Um, um, our research in this area started a number of years ago, but today what I'm going to talk about is kind of an ongoing and continuing field that we work in. And, um, and I've done now Dawn or Doom. I think this is my fourth. I've been a speaker four out of the five years. And unfortunately, what you've signed up for this early in the morning on a Monday is probably a little more doom than dawn. Uh, so I always get accused when we have the dinner at the Westwood at the end of the night that I'm much more of a doom guy. But I guess, you know, uh, that's the way it goes. You have to have a little bit of doom. Or, and let's face it, doom sells. So uh, doom sells newspapers. So let's see if we can get this going. Okay, kind of the agenda. I'm going to introduce my team. This is not a, a one-person show. I actually have a large uh, contingent of graduate students. Some are here, and I have lots of visiting. We'll talk about the gra uh, background of this. We'll talk about the motivation. Uh, when you think about this kind of research, and on the other side, the people we're going up against, um, there's a lot of motivation involved. Uh, then we'll talk about some of the threats. And some of this, if you were here last year, I kind of introduced some of these threats because they were starting to emerge uh, and be identified by different government agencies. And now we're one year in, and we start to see actionable phases of some of these things coming along. So uh, here's the team. Um, so the group, uh, we just took a recent group picture this week or last Friday. And there's actually a couple of people missing that were on interviews and out. But uh, um, we have 20 graduate students, two visiting scholars, a couple of undergraduate researchers. And then we have visiting groups of, uh, of Korean students that are sponsored. Um, and come over here about 90 a year that also help work on some of these projects. And we do work for a lot of different government agencies and companies and things, and this is not even a complete list, but this gives you a little bit of a look. And the ironic thing, or I guess the ironic thing is, uh, for those of you that are local, we actually are located in an old church. Uh, right across the street, our offices and our labs in the old university church, which is now the MDM lab and the, the Korean software square. We also broad this, broaden this out to work with a lot of international partners. We uh, do research across the globe. I travel quite a bit. Uh, we're working on some of these different projects in Europe, uh, uh, South Korea. We're looking at things in South America. Um, and we're actually not only trying to deploy some of these and look at some of these things here, but also go to other places. Now, as far as background research, you know, uh, the, the the introduction was we kind of work at the crossroads of these things. And that's absolutely true. The main focus of what we do and how we kind of got started in this whole area is we do AI and robotics. And I was in industry. I'm kind of a non-traditional uh, faculty because I spent 14 years in industry doing applied AI for things that aren't academically related. When I got out and came here, we started doing work. Um, with people like police and firefighters, first responders, Department of Homeland Security. And that's where a lot of the work came in. So we kind of focus a lot in safety, you know, working with people like police, firefighters, first response, um, security, things like after disasters. A lot of sensors that we use are after disasters, so like an explosion. You know, like this is a gas leak from a small town that can be toxic. We use UAVs to go in there on an Air Force Research Labs project and determine whether those gases were dangerous, where they were going, did 3D modeling and all of that. Uh, we also, the robot up here was a joint project we did with a company in Korea and the Korean government to fight fires like the one you see in the lower right hand corner. This was, uh, this robot was actually in this fire. It was in Hoopston, Illinois uh, a few years ago. Uh, it was a tire remanufacturing plant. And instead of firefighters go in, we build robots that would go in and fight the fire. And the robot sits out on the truck and just drives it around just like you'd play a video game. So that's the kind of work we do. Now, I always like to look at this kind of in the background as perspective of where do we come from and where are we going? You know, I think about this, and I'm, I'm getting a little more advanced in age. So in my lifetime, I always think about how technology has changed. So in the last 20 years, 20 years ago, I never thought I could connect everybody in the world instantly, right? And like we can do that now. 10 years ago, I never thought revolutions would begin because of a Twitter feed. You know, if you look at the Arab Spring, you look at things, how technology has not only enabled us, but changed the way the world shapes up and changed our lives. Currently, 
there's a threat, you know, if we look, and this is the kind of the talk today, is there's a threat from the land, the air, and the sea. We actually have threats and opportunities from every direction and every place we go. And in some cases, we are vulnerable. You know? Now, we think about that, but that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. We just have to be, as always, watching. Five to 20 years from now, what's possible? You know, and that's kind of where we look. We, we talk, I do a lot of speeches around the world about this and say, wh where do we go with this? And where does AI go? And frankly, I mean, that's the whole point of Dawn or Doom is to look and see, is, is this going to save us or be the eventual end? All right? Now, in this, in this speech today, one point of clarification. Technically, we use the term actor a lot. Actor uh, doesn't mean like Alec Baldwin or, you know, Jessica Lange or somebody like that. Act, uh, actors means like a, kind of a generic term for cars or planes or UAVs. So when I use actors, I'm not mentioning Hollywood. So as we go through autonomous actors such as robots or cars, advance in intelligence, control and autonomy, does this placement within human society make us safer? Or does it increase our overall risk of exposure or risk and exposure? So today we're going to talk about different risks of humanity. Now, like once I... I said earlier, I'm probably going to be a little more on the doom side, but um, that's sometimes I just try to be pro not provocative, but try to wake people up. Now, one thing I'll tell you that um, on the first slide, I work for the Board of Army Science and Technology um, for the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. And what we do is we look at military threats, and I have to have security clearance and all those things. But those things I can't talk about just because they're not cleared for this kind of public audience, but I can tell you there are a lot of risks out there that we constantly have to be aware of. And sometimes I can tell you also ignorance is bliss uh, if you don't know everything that's going on. So provocative topic today. Are non-human intelligent actors the dawn of a bright future or the sign of doom for the human race? Now there's lots of things on both sides, right? Now I'm specifically talking about one area of actors. And what is the outcome of a world full of good and bad autonomous actors, basically non-humans? Probably most of you 20 years ago didn't have a robot running around your home. Many of you today may have a robot vacuum cleaner. You may have, you know, IoT. You may have Nest. You may have different things. You may have Ring. All these are enabling technologies and some are good. But, you know, most people probably don't know their electronic vacuum cleaner has a camera on it, which means if somebody else can get control of it, they can follow you around and watch what you do in your own home. Now, I know that because we tried that, and it's kind of funny. Uh, but people don't like it if they know that. Now, does it also emulate human behavior? The whole idea of AI was to sort of recreate the science, nature, mystic, you know, mystical thoughts of, of humans and put that into some sort of artificial form that we could rec recreate it and take advantage of it. All right. So today, our goals not really answer the question. We're not really going to answer a lot of questions today, right? I'm going to hopefully make you think. Um, I'm going to hopefully make you aware of the changing world around you as specific to these kind of technologies, um, whereas this kind of technology may impact your life. But also the fact that what's different about now than 20 years ago is 20 years ago, we didn't have this continuous kind of uh, ability to surveil, to see, to understand and connect. On one of my previous slides, I said, you know, I never thought 20 years ago that I could connect anybody around the world instantaneously. That means they can also connect to me. That means they can also connect to my devices, which are connected to cameras and microphones and things like that. Like your cell phone that listens to you all the time. Or your, you know, your little device from, like some large companies that you set on your desk to order things or make music play that listens to you all the time. There's a lot of ways and things that we've purposely invited into our life uh, that sometimes we should shut off and, uh, and never have around. OK. So post-Cold War reality. Provocative question. What's more dangerous? You know, in the, in the, I grew up in the Cold War, and most of you or many of you didn't, right? It's, you, ne you never were around the Cold War. You, you know it's history and it's history books. What's more dangerous, nuclear weapons controlled by nations or cheap, weaponizable technology that's accessible to every single human on Earth? You know, it's hard to get your hands. I grew up three miles away from a Titan II missile base. You know, I never knew what it was. 
but it didn't really affect me. You know, the Russians never, you know, tried to hit it. But a couple of years ago, I had some people visiting from Kazakhstan, and they said, well, how, how really hard is it to get these UAVs? How hard is it to get accessible to these, uh, these weapons that you talk about? And I go, well, let's try it. So we were coming back from a day in Chicago where we ate deep dish pizza and saw some big buildings, and we stopped at the Loves in Merrillville, which is just south of Chicago, which is a big truck stop, and I said, let's go in here. We're going to get some gas, and we'll go in here. And what I did in that truck stop that's out in the middle of nowhere pointed out the nine different UAV models that you could buy in that truck stop there. So I said, it's pretty easy to get this technology, and anybody can buy it, right? So there's lots of risks and rewards. Once again, this is not about military technology. This is not about, which I look at a lot. I've got a son in the military. That's a completely different space. This is about the technology that's sitting next to you. So there are risk and rewards. We want to think near term. Near term, autonomous technology can remove us from harm's way by replacing humans in dangerous and undesirable jobs. Long term, it's going to create exposure to risk. And I parallel this to the internet. We think about the internet. When the internet first came out, all we thought about was, hey, we can email people, we can connect, we can exchange things online, we can do all these things. When the internet first came out, nobody thought about really, everybody going to steal my data, hack my stuff, listen to me, surveil me, uh, break into my uh, identity, steal all this. People didn't really think about that. They thought the positive sides. Only later were you really woken up to the realities of the devious and dubious people that get out there and, and use it for bad, bad things. So there is a dark side, right? We look at you know, the, nuclear, the nuclear bomb, but we also look at things like places like North Korea. You know, there are places, and obviously things have warmed up a little bit, but they've also carried out attacks, you know, that Hollywood made, or Sony made a movie a couple of years ago uh, about Kim Jong-un, and they used a lot of the resources to attack Sony and shut them down. They didn't go to Sony and did that. They did it from another location. And lastly, anybody ever seen something like this? This was something that was in an airport, right? Just an anonymous package. This is the reason they clear airports, is because this is actually a fairly small bag. You could carry this around, but it's also something that would be great for storing a lot of ammonium nitrate with a trigger and some sort of device, which would level a small building. So this is it. Now, once again, I said, this is not about military. Military is a completely separate threat. And it's also really, really hard to get your hands on a military drone. We tried, you know, for some reason the administration the university didn't like that. You know, we've tried to get G mini guns and mortars, but for some reason they don't like those kind of things on campus. I don't understand, but that's okay. But what's the real autonomous threat? The real autonomous threat is not that these things are explosive, that these things are uh, big and expensive. It's they're cheap. They're available everywhere. They have agility, which means they can move around easily. I can take a UAV and put it in my bag. I can take some of the explosives, put them in my bag, and carry them anywhere, and you don't even know about it. In fact, there's a lot of them now that even get past, some of these things can get past airport scanners. Penetration capability. It's easy to walk in anywhere with a lot of these things. They can carry a payload. A lot of UAVs, how many people, how many people use UAVs or have flown a UAV in here? A few? Most of the time when you look at a UAV, a small, like a DJ Phantom, it says, oh, it's payload's only like, it's less than a pound. We tried it out with fire, firefighters and EOD people here to actually blow stuff up. It can, we found it can actually carry six pounds. It can carry a six pound charge, but it does it for a very, very short time. And the flight time goes from 15 minutes to about two minutes, but it can, for that verifiable threat, do that. So all of these things, and the fact that they can't be tracked, it can't be tracked from a human standpoint, and it's almost impossible to even pick it up on things like military radar. So this is not a good combination for the motivated. And what's probably most dangerous about anything is current policy. You know, and I, if I look at not to get political, I stay apolitical in these things, but I'll complain about uh, lawmakers in one point is in the last two years, everybody spent a lot of time making legislations about how to attack different political parties. But what they haven't done is worked on solving any of these problems. And I'm going to 
This is one point I'll tell you about because I see this every day. Every day that we don't try to solve these problems I'm talking about, the people that are working on these problems on the other side get one more day ahead. And trust me, they're pretty motivated actors. Okay, so the motivation. The motivation here is while the opportunities are vast, the threats are greater. Like I said, we parallel this to the internet and the profile. When we look at counter UAS, uh, counter UAS means a UAS or a UAV. Uh, I'll have some acronyms in here that I'll explain. That means the whole idea of when some terrorist puts up a UAV, how do we actually knock it out of the sky? How do we take and remediate that threat, right? Now, we started working on this in 2015. We were called to kind of a semi-secret meeting after the UAV landed on the White House. How many people remember that event? A few. Okay, just to put it in perspective for the people that may weren't, maybe weren't here or don't remember it, or um, the real counter UAS, I guess, impact started in 2015 in January. Uh, President Obama was in the White House at that time, and somebody landed a small Class 1 UAV about 25 feet in front of the front door at the White House. Now, the good news is, as are most of these, it wasn't a planned attack. It was, uh, it was actually, honestly, an inebriated Department of Defense worker trying to impress his girlfriend with his drone flying skills, apparently, about 3 o'clock in the morning uh, in his drone, which most of them fly off, uh, in his drone flew off and landed in the most protected airspace in the world. Now, that's not good for anybody. I, from what I understand, it wasn't good for that person's career. Um, now, I don't know. I'd, I'd never heard from him again. I'm not sure, but uh, maybe he's somewhere. Now, what it did expose, though, is you have the most protected airspace in the world, which is the White House and the Capitol Mall. And if you've ever been there, and if you ever want to test this, go see the White House and try to jump over the fence and see how far you get. It won't go. Now, don't do that, please, because uh, you will get caught pretty quickly. The problem is you can take a $500 UAV and fly it in there, and there's absolutely no protection at all. Now, I know this because we're working with uh, people who run the, the White House, and, the, and that's one of the places we, we've worked. We were one of the groups that actually were asked to go solve that problem, and they made it an easy project. They said, we need an actionable, fieldable system uh, within 90 days, and they asked eight different teams in the U.S. We were one of them. Uh, we actually did it in 88 days. All the other teams quit. And so it was a Purdue first. I won't show, I, I show it all the time and people say you have to stop showing that video. But if anybody wants to see it, contact me after and I'll show it to you. Now, even today though, three years later, no real systems can act as a true deterrent, right? There's 67 different companies it's just in the US that are building counter UAS systems. And almost all of them, almost all of them, depend on somebody sitting there flying it, right? They're using radio interference to basically say, well, we have the person flying it, and we have the UAV out there. The problem is that's not real anymore because if I'm a terrorist, I don't need to. I can get cheap technology I can buy off Amazon, put on that UAV, pull it out of the trunk of my car, get it in the air, and send it at a target. I can get back in my car and drive away. By the time it hits the target, I'm out of town, and there's no traceable way to get back to me unless they find DNA or forensic evidence on that UAV. So the game has changed. But once again, we're behind, right? Now, this is especially difficult in a civilian non-battlefield scenario. No counter UAS systems are low regret. The problem is they're building counter UAS systems for military because military has big budget, right, $700 billion. Police, police stations, which are all typically uh, somewhat independent in their purchasing, fire stations, Local uh, DHS don't have that kind of budget, so they can't go out and afford these kind of things. So with CUGV, uh, uh, ground vehicles, and water vehicles, which I'll also talk about, we haven't even begun talking about those. And they actually pose a bigger threat. So uh, counter uh, unmanned ground vehicles, CUGV, and counter unmanned water vehicles are probably even bigger threats, and they will become bigger threats in the next five years. There's actually no even plans for those. So threat in the air, what is it? All right, so this is after when we were doing the, the counter UAV project. And we see that a UAV, the big problem is we can't see it or hear it. And we did this by testing. This is the Purdue Stadium. This obviously not last Saturday because there were like 65,000 people there. We were there.
But we went out at the invitation of the Purdue police and said, how big of a problem is this? So we flew, we had my graduate students fly UAVs over the stadium and down past the seats and through the goalpost. We didn't get three points because we went the wrong way. But we went through the goalpost and just flown down the stadium. And from the top of the kind of the crow's nest on top, it's hard to even see a UAV. It's hard to see it visually. It's almost impossible to see it. And even during the counter UAV program we had, we had a $12 million military radar that was for tracking inbound ballistic rounds from snipers. And it couldn't even see this past about 300 meters. It's a difficult task. Can't see it or hear it. Can detect it about 300 meters, moving at 20 meters per second. Which means the task you have is, you have 15 seconds from the time you see it or hear it till it's going to hit, right? Now the scenario is this one. Now a lot of times people go, well, that's a little crazy. M67 hand grenade, mayonnaise jar, and UAV. It's tough to buy M67 hand grenades in the US because they're military style, but you can buy fake ones, you can buy actually stolen ones, you can buy uh, black market M67 hand grenades in Tijuana, Juarez, pretty much any, any city controlled by a cartel. You can typically buy them on the street. Uh, not, not cheap, but they're not expensive. If you take a hand grenade, you pull the pin and keep the lever depressed and slide it in a mayonnaise jar. You can put three of them in there, put the mayonnaise jar, or put the lid on it, tape it to the bottom of this UAV and fly it into a stadium. When it hits, the mayonnaise jar breaks, all three of the um, hand grenades roll out, become armed within three or four seconds, blow, and each one of them has a, somewhere of a 10 to 15 meter kill radius. Now, I didn't make this up. This was a very viable threat that we got from a certain three-letter government agency saying you have to combat these kind of things. Now, if you think about Purdue Stadium or any stadium, what you really think about is the initial that thing is going to be terrible, right? You're going to have a UAV that flies in, drops three hand grenades, a number of people are maimed and killed. But what about the other 65,000 people that are all now rushing to try to get out of the stadium? You're going to have probably way more people attacked, panicking to get out to remediate the, the next threat, okay? Now, what's the mitigation? Radio jamming? Well, there's nothing to jam. I can actually wrap my UAV in tinfoil and keep most electromagnetic theory or uh, uh, signals out of it. It's also illegal to do so in civilian airspace, right? Under current policy or no policy, it's actually illegal to do a lot of these things. The funny thing is, and this is kind of a, it's a funny thing, but it's also real. When we looked at this, uh, we were actually putting systems in the air to remediate these. And what we found out is that if I, acting on behalf of the police or an agency, go out and kill a UAV, but it's not actually a threat, I'm somewhere between a pirate and a terrorist. So the person who's trying to stop it actually ends up being the bad person, depending on what government agency. If I take it down and kill it, I'm a terrorist, because a UAV has got the same tail number as a Cessna. And if I just capture it, and take control of it, I'm a pirate, just like in Somalia, right? So uh, these are some of the current problems we have. But how can we defend these spaces? When it's easy to transport, no traceability, very capable, hard to see. If you go to the White House, there's not very many meters between that front gate and that front door. And then at 15, 20 meters a second, the time to get there, it's not very fast. Now, if you're a news watcher, or if you're just particularly interested in Venezuela, you might have seen this a couple of months ago. Uh, President Maduro, who, I guess to put it lightly, he's probably the most popular, not the most popular guy in the whole world, but he's a head of state, right? And he deserves certain, uh, uh, certain protections. When he was giving a speech, uh, I believe it was in the middle of Caracas, two UAVs came with explosives. And this is actually a superimposed picture in the middle of the first one going off and attacked him. And the protection they threw up in the lower picture were actually umbrellas and Kevlar blankets, which did work. One person did get hit with some shrapnel and was bleeding. But the reality is, here's the damage. Now, luckily, it wasn't close to him. Now, whether you like Maduro or not, you know, this is, uh, I don't like this kind of thing going on. Of course, he blamed it on the US and Colombia. But uh, nobody really knows exactly, I guess, well, they haven't got to the bottom of exactly who did it. Uh, in this case, though, Here's a president surrounded by troops, surrounded by soldiers, surrounded by uh, people 
that are there to protect him. But this came in, they didn't see it till right at the end. And if you go watch the video, uh, all of a sudden it looks up and a couple of seconds later it blows up, right? They had just enough time to get the umbrella and the Kevlar. Now the umbrella actually does work uh, unless it's a direct hit, right? But once again, when we look at something like that, how easy would it be to attack the Purdue Stadium? Now I don't, I'm glad I'm doing this today and not before the game because I did this last Friday so for some rich alumni groups and that I think I scared them. Some didn't go to the game they interrupted. At least they were concerned about it, right? You have a president standing there and it's hard to protect him. How hard is it to protect 65,000 people in a stadium when there's a few hundred police standing around, mostly at the ground level, mostly with their eyes on ground level trying to keep people from doing bad things or being drunk and, you know, and, and, but they are actually watching this. The police are charged, uh, the Purdue police and local police are charged from watching this. Now, you may say, well, it's really hard to get your hand on M67. I'm not going to go to some uh, border town to try to buy it from a cartel, which could also be dangerous. You don't have to. Anybody know what's in the hand? Fertilizer, right? Fertilizer wrapped up with a simple device. I go out because of some of our work. I've been out with our EOD, our bomb, uh, local bomb, typical new bomb uh, uh, detail. And I've seen improvised or explosive devices like these where I don't have to go get military grade hardware. I can get things like common household chemicals or some common types of fertilizer I can buy in 25 pound bags and fuel oil and basic triggers and a GPS switch and a charger all things I can buy fairly locally that can do almost the same damage. I was uh, out with EOD one night. They called us to go out. There was a bomb at a local, or what they thought was a bomb in a domestic dispute. And when we went there, it was actually like a giant firecracker, just like this one. And the guy had built this and put uh, black powder surrounded by nails and shrapnel, just stuff he'd bought at looked like Home Depot. And when it detonated, the bomb actually went off. We were 100 meters away over the top of a building, and we had nails from that bomb landing around us. So if you're within a few feet, this is, this is probably even more dangerous than a hand grenade in a lot of ways. If hand grenade has a kill ratio of uh, a few meters, this one was probably worse because it's got a bigger charge. Okay. Once again, what's the real cheap to us, or real threat to us? Cheap. Available anywhere, anyone can buy. Everything I've shown you so far in the first part of this, anybody can get. But what about protection? Federal government agencies are all developing plans, but currently regulations restrict from doing much of the research to com com uh, combat bad drones. We're still sitting on kind of go. Now here's some threats on the ground. We talked about UAVs, but let me kind of finish with talking a few of these. And this is where I think that we really get into problems. How many people in here use Lyft or Uber? A few? Okay. Now, Lyft or Uber can be used in small towns or smaller towns like Lafayette. You can do bigger towns. But there's a company called Cruise Automation, and, there's, and the reason I use them, it's not to bag on Cruise. Cruise is the leader in, I would say, the leader in autonomous vehicle technology. Uh, and one of my students was the 15th person hired there. He's one of their top research scientists, and I was just out to visit him a week ago. Uh, Cruise Automation in San Francisco, GM will deploy automated rideshare cars very quickly. Last year they said li with Lyft in 2018, those things have changed a little bit. They're looking at next year. But this was one of their cars out on the road, and they're really cool. But the whole idea is you're, you're getting rid of the driver, you're getting rid of the one person that can actually, you know, dispense human uh, ability. But what if I call in an autonomous ride, and instead of me getting in, you know, I sit there and I put in my GPS point and put in where I'm going. Instead of me going in and getting in, I throw in a, a barrel of ammonium nitrate and diesel fuel, a charger, and a GPS trigger that also has the same GPS point of where I'm going. and says, when you get to this GPS point, blow up. Now, some of you probably older folks like me may remember this picture. This is Oklahoma City the worst act of domestic terrorism we've ever had in the history of our country. I can't remember, I think it's 193 people were killed and many, many people were injured. And my family lives very close to that, so to me it's still something that's, but this was a guy doing the same thing, basically putting several of these barrels in a rider truck. 
So this was a Ryder truck full of barrels that blew up the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. But just imagine if you put in a, a bunch of cars in a coordinated attack all to arrive at the place within a few seconds of each other. And instead of one focus blast, you had a bunch of blasts. Now, is that fiction? Last year, I, I approached some car companies and they said, you'd have to take off your tinfoil hat. They said, oh, you're just imagining things. Nobody's ever going to use it for that. I said, well, Uber, your valuation is $60 billion. If one of your cars is using an attack like this, what do you think your valuation will be next? Not so much, right? Well, accessible in every major city, accessible to anyone with a cell phone. A lot of you already have this. This is a quote from a guy, Grayson Burlt. It's an indication that Cruise is getting ready to commercialize autonomous ride sharing service to the public, and it'll be in San Francisco this year, within the next few months. They had, a, they had some different cash infusions from SoftBank, and it's kind of slowed it down because they're changing partners, but they're going to roll it out. But what about protection? Here's where the tinfoil hat comes off. This is within, this is September. Two wannabe ISIS terrorists planned an attack involving a self-driving car because they no longer wanted to blow themselves up. This was reported by The Guardian and The New York Post. Uh, ISIS has been developing a driverless car bomb since at least 2016. So ISIS is looking at what autonomous car companies are doing and building their threats to match it. So this is not something that's years away. This is not something that's on the horizon. This is something they're trying right now. And if you've noticed what's happening in the world of terrorism, they're not necessarily rolling, they're finding it more expedient not to roll in with a bunch of guns and shoot up people. They're rolling in with a giant truck and driving it into crowds. Now, if you, there's Nice, France, where they drove a truck in and killed a bunch of people in a big crowd. But what if you go in and do the initial thing of killing a bunch of people and then blow the truck up? You're going to have a lot more carnage, a lot more damage. And unfortunately, that's what we're looking at. The potential to weaponize autonomous driving technology using existing technology and vehicles already exists. They've been working on it, at least in what we know, for two years. Autonomous driving, this is by a, uh, an investigation site called the Hacker Noon. Autonomous driving technology is already considered a clear and present danger, and it's only a matter of time until a terrorist attack or criminal act using self-defense cars take place. When I was out a bit a week ago, I said that I kind of cited these things. They didn't tell me I had a tinfoil hat this time. They said, yeah, we have to look at this. So what do we have to do? Because now they're looking at value. They're, what happens, you know, Lyft and Uber will be gone um, if their cars are used to carry out one of these kind of attacks. Now, on the positive side, the FBI reports that driverless cars could revolutionize high-speed chases, freeing up passengers and the pursued vehicles to conduct tasks that are impossible with their hands on the steering wheel. So if you had four FBI agents in there, one doesn't have to drive now, now you can have four guns, four people working on the problem instead of driving the car, shooting at pursuers or civilians or, or whatever they're going to do. And that was a study actually done by RAND, which is fairly reputable. Right? What about cars? Cars are nice. We all like cars. But what about something bigger? D11 key Caterpillar 350, 350.08B EUI diesel with electronic control. 915 gross horsepower and weighs 248,000 pounds. That's this one. That's pretty big. Also, we're being made autonomous because they want to put them in mines, pit mines, strip mines. They don't want to pay humans because humans are shifts and only work eight hours a day. The whole reason that people want to do autonomous cars is, is not because they want to be lazy. It's because they want to increase the capability and uptime of using these vehicles, just like trucks. I can drive a truck for every minute of the day except when I have to refuel it. If I have a driver, drivers are limited to what? About 10 hours a day of driving. They have to keep logs. No driver, you don't have to worry about that. You can be going 23 hours a day, increase utilization. So when you have something like an autonomous semi-truck or this T-80, actually some, some guy got loose with one of these and basically destroyed an entire small town. Now, it wasn't a terrorist act. I think he just was crazy, but he apparently had the keys to it and went crazy. And, and uh, you just roll through right through any house. You can actually roll through the large girders of a building. You could t potentially knock down something like the large apartment complexes we're building here fairly easily. So the impact of that in the terrorist hands are catastrophic. This is their next target. There's already scenarios where 
ISIS is also looking at semi-trucks because in the U.S. we're going to have 60,000 of these on the road within the next three years. At least that's the plan. And lastly, the threat in the water. Now, I haven't gotten much updates on this because the first company, which is a Norwegian company to do this, uh, they're actually doing it to haul fertilizer, which is ironic. So the robo-ship without a single human on board, they're now pushed back their launch to 2019. Earlier I told you that one of the things that could be detonated with fuel oil is fertilizer. Imagine if you had an entire ship full of it, you took it over and made it weaponizable. What kind of bomb would you have? Or the other uh, scenario I saw was, what if you had a dirty bomb or a small you know, suitcase nuke and you put it on here? If you know much about shipping, how long is a ship in port before somebody actually investigates the cargo of the ship? It's already in the port. You've already let them in your house. If there's no humans on board to check it, somebody can assemble that at the uh, start, and when you, get to the, when you get to the end, that's where the big boom happens. Okay, so threat analysis. One of the things we work on, how do we mitigate these threats? We now have threats from sky, land, and water. All these technologies are surrounding us every day. How do we make technology accessible and low cost to combat this? How do we train first responders in various agencies? And in fact, how do we train general public to say, how do we spot this threat? How do we see this threat coming? You know, if somebody walks up to you on the street with a gun and points it in your face, you typically perceive that as a threat, right? Most of us would if you've ever had that experience. I have. You perceive that as a threat, but you don't look at an Uber pulling up next to you as a threat, right? If you were close, I spend a lot of time in Paris. Uh, now there are certain train stations because they're on high alert all the time. There are certain subway stations, train stations I won't even go to because they're such giant targets. It's not worth going. I'd rather walk or go around, right, because of threats and knowing what the threats are. How to set cohesive policy, policy how to regulate solutions, and what are best practices. Now, the final thing I'll kind of leave you with is we are way behind. There is no viable defense for these things. Hopefully, we won't spend the next two years, or the next four years, or the next six years in Washington trying to get elected. Hopefully, they'll actually, at some point, put some time into this. Uh, and I don't care if you're Rebel Republican, Democrat, uh, uh, Independent, Whig Party, you know, Greens Party, Socialist Party, whatever. The terrorists don't care which one you're in. They don't, they're not selecting parties. They're basically selecting targets. And in this case, that, that's the one thing where I go to Washington, I actually say, we need to get on this problem a little better than we are. All right, thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? And please don't just run out and say, I'm, I'm just going to go curl up in my home and, and never go outside again. Hi. Um, so uh, I was curious what your thoughts were on regarding um, intercepting unmanned aerial vehicles. I don't know that this would be the end-all, be-all solution, but I have seen some videos that appear to indicate success training some species of large eagle and hawk. Yep. Uh, so where we lack artificial intelligence, real intelligence might benefit us? The, the, first, the first meeting we went to, uh, uh, we were put in kind of red-blue teams to sort of think what are the threats and how, what are the solutions. The guy I sat next to was a guy who just retired from the Navy SEALs after he'd been in the military for 25 years. And we talked about that. He was going, we got to use raptors. You know, in Afghanistan and Iraq, we use raptors. And I said, well, okay, that's great. Do you think they would work? And he goes, we could train them, but it's 50-50. Uh, because, you know, like hunting, hunting birds of prey in the Middle East are a common sport. And I said, well, what do you mean 50-50? He goes, the problem is if somebody, if they know enough about it to throw a rabbit out on the ground, the bird of prey is going to say, well, I can, this is not food, and this is food. And so they said they're very effective in that, uh, in the fact that, you know, these birds, some of the birds are really big, they're very powerful. Most class one UAVs, they can knock out of the sky really easy, uh, and they can catch them. The problem is distracting the birds and keeping them on task. And that, from what I understand, that's the biggest issue. But people are, people are doing that and using that.
the most amazing thing about this is watching her draw this because uh, you know I'm I'm fascinated by that so you know it's a clap for that because I can do this but I can't draw a straight line on a piece of paper so that to me that's truly amazing stuff all right any other questions all right thank you very much for your attention and have a good day at Donner Doom um, and thanks for coming